The theme is quite simple. It's that lots of tiny little interactions often contribute to extraordinary moments. He is an author and an entrepreneur. He was the editor-in-chief of Wired for more than 10 years. He's written The Long Tail, uh, Free, and most recently Makers. Uh, and then he up and decided that the next revolution is going to be uh, about atoms and all things made by humans again. Chris Anderson. Thank you. Sixty days ago, I quit my job as the editor of Wired, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I'd done for 12 years and loved, and loved the job and, and, and was very proud of what we achieved. But um, basically, I started making things, did some projects with my children, went right down the rabbit hole and recognized that um, the smartphone revolution uh, was doing something extraordinary with the underlying components of the smartphone, MEMS processors and GPS and cameras and wireless and ARM processors and all that, and realized that this was one of those kind of moments when suddenly hardware started to take along a lot of the same dynamics as software. Low barriers to entry, web-based open innovation models, cloud, cloud manufacturing, that basically we've democratized the biggest industry in the world, manufacturing. And I wrote a book called Makers about it, and uh, I was so convinced by this book, I actually uh, acted on it. Today, I run two factories, one in San Diego, one in Tijuana. We're, we're about 52 people, we'll be 100 people by the end of the year. And um, my partner, Jordi Munoz, this is a guy I met on the internet who was a 19-year-old high school student from Tijuana, uh, <laughs> is, is now um, president of 3D Robotics. So what I'm going to talk about is really specifically what we do as a kind of a case study of why, of how hardware has become the new software. And, and atoms are the new bits. So I'm just going to start with uh, you know my story. I've got five kids, um, four to, to 15, and I'm constantly trying to get them interested in science and technology and have you know, just epic fail. I mean, absolutely zero hit rate. Um, <laughs> and I'm constantly starting with new things to try to change that. And one of them was Lego Mindstorms, where um, uh, Lego very kindly sent us the first Lego Mindstorms 2.0 kit, um, the beta testers, and I brought home and it's like, what could go wrong, right? We're going to build a robot with Lego. My children love Lego. We're going to build a robot. Um, here's what could go wrong. Hollywood has set our expectations for robots way <laughs> out of line. So when you spend all morning building a Lego robot, it's a three-wheel tribot, and um, you program it, and it goes up against the wall, and then it backs away. And they're like, that sucked. Um, I, by the way, thought it was awesome, and I love Lego Mindstorms, but the, again, kids are hard to impress with robots. Um, and then, they, uh, then somebody sent us this like, radio control airplane, which we went to the park and promptly flew into a tree. But I was so kind of frustrated by that experience. You know, robots, airplanes, and the kids are like, um, And I thought, what, what would be more interesting than that? And um, I thought, you know, that Lego, it had like sensors, like gyros and accelerometers and magnetometers and a Bluetooth connection you could connect to. I mean, I bet that Lego could have flown the plane better than me. I thought, maybe it could have flown the plane better. I said, kids, one last thing. Let's build a Lego autopilot. So here it is, the world's first Lego autopilot. This is the Lego Mindstorm skits. This is the gyroscope. This is an accelerometer. This is a magnetometer. This is an interface to radio control. And we uh, put it in a uh, plane. And this is the <coughs> world's first Lego unmanned aerial vehicle, Lego drone. It's not actually the world's greatest drone. Just barely flew. But still, I was super proud. We, um, we did this about five years ago. And, um, what it, and the kids then immediately lost interest. But I then thought, that's kind of amazing that my children and I can build a drone, a really flying, fully autonomous, GPS-guided you know, aircraft at a Lego on our kitchen table. That didn't used to be possible. Thank you, smartphones. What we're seeing right now is what I call the peace dividend of the smartphone wars, because now these eco incredible economies of scale, these incredible volumes out there in the smartphone revolution have made these components available to us in robotics and the Internet of Things and everything else. <laughs> kind of a web guy and I thought, you know, pff, well, I don't know anything about this. It seems kind of interesting. The only thing to do here is to share my ignorance. So let's, you know, being stupid in public, I find, is a really useful technique because um, it turns out other people had many of the same questions. So we started a site called DIY Drones and today it's the biggest robotics community in the world. It was built around participation from, from the start. And out of this came what is today's company? Um, uh, the developers, uh, the hardware designers, the software designers, the um, you know the um, graphic designers, the documentation editors, um, hundreds of developers all came out of this community to come together and build this. And um, so we're an open source hardware company, open source software company. So when you look at our, the people who, who, who write our code, by day they work for Apple or Google or Microsoft or IBM. By night they work for us. 
and you know they put in sometimes 40 hours a week and they're incredibly smart we could never hire them they are you know, world class engineers but if you put if you start a community if you do something in public and start something that they find driven by their own passion then they're like whatever you know here you have all my talents all my time yeah. i just love this i'm doing it because it's scratching my own itch and we've seen this time and time again in software but now it's starting to apply to hardware as well <laughs> So what we decided kind of is, is that you know, we're kind of you know, a bottoms up grassroots alternative to the aerospace industry. We're not gonna take manned aircraft and take out the man. We're gonna take toys and add brains to them. This is the world's first universal autopilot. And what happens is you get a box and then you just download free software. Everything's, everything's all the bits are free. Um, and, um, and you sort of say, what do I wanna fly? You know, what, I'm, what am I gonna put this in? Am I gonna put in a car that turns it into an autonomous rover? Am I gonna put in an airplane that's a fixed wing drone? Am I gonna put in a traditional helicopter? I'm going to put it in one of these multi-copters, and we build a platform that's basically designed for children. And it, we, our figure, our, our thought is if it, if it works for kids, it works for farmers. But the inverse is not true, right? So we, we, build, we build a super reliable, super easy to use, inexpensive platform, but it's an open platform, so all those verticals can then be built on top of it. So my job is to take us from kind of, you know, bag of, we started with bag of parts, we're now kind of like, you know, ready to fly, but still you need some familiarity with like radio control, and move us into sort of iPhone territory, where you just open the box, you know, it just, it just works. Turn on your tablet, turn on your phone, and it's just, it's just ready to go. So I think the number one barrier you know, we've, we've accomplished a lot with robotics, especially flying robots. They're, they're reliable, they're incredibly powerful, they're cheap, but they're not easy yet. And I think complexity is the biggest barrier to adoption. Um, we don't think that people should fly aircraft. We think that people should assign missions and let the computers fly the aircraft. So these are waypoints. You click on the waypoints and you assign it. And you assign tasks, take off, landing, look at a certain thing, look at a region of interest, follow, um, follow uh, you know, an, an object, um, you know, go to a different altitude, uh, loiter, which is to sort of wait there for a certain length of time. It's all scriptable. You can script in Python if you want, or you can just sort of click and, click and drag. Um, but that's, that's what's possible with drones. And the question, why would you use one? Um, well, he here's just one simple thing. Um, so remember when I got started, I crashed my first plane I was flying, because flying is really hard, and I really, really suck at it. Well, these are uncrashable. Um, and so what you do is, is, if you're flying, you put this in, and let's say you want to teach a kid how to fly. Um, what you do is you just, on Google, on the ground station, which is, uses Google uh, Maps, you just define a box. And this is like your, this is the park, let's say. You define a box, and then you have a floor and a ceiling. And it's called a geofence. Then you give the controller to a kid, and you say, go for it. And, you know, let's say maybe they do the worst thing. They just jam the, the elevator forward. It goes, it hits the bottom of the geofence, which is 100, let's say 100 meters, and then takes control away from the pilot, returns it, and then backs, puts it back in the loiter mode. These are great sort of learning tools. Why are we controlling any kind of vehicle without, these, without a computer kind of watching, ready to take over? What's fascinating about this kind of bottoms up approach is that we have a lower regulatory barrier than, than, than the pros. Um, um, the, way, the way it works is drones are, are, cannot be flown commercially in the national airspace, which is the air, uh, but they can be flown non-commercially. And, um, and these are the things that when you introduce words like personal and desktop to, a to an industrial technology, suddenly what you do is you vastly change the class of user. And it's all great technology revolutions are not about the technology, they're about who's using it. The personal computer was not the most powerful computer in the world, it was just the most personal. And it was the use cases that, blew, that changed the world. The internet was a, mil was a military industrial technology until we got dial-up modems and started using it ourselves, and then we changed the world. And adding words personal to drone fundamentally changes the use case. Uh, well, you know, what would you do with it? How many of you would love a better aerial view of what you're doing with the GoPro? Would like to put the GoPro <laughs> in the air? Exactly, okay. How about if you just were carrying a little box, a little box on your belt, and you, you know, once you're doing something awesome on the bay or wherever, you just press the button and you say, that, now I would like to film this. And the copter takes off from the beach, comes out, positions itself 30 feet up and 30 feet behind you, and then as you do your thing, it just sort of follows you around, keeps the camera pointed on you, and now you have, you know, these are the droids you're looking for. <laughs> You've got a personal camera droid that just follows you doing your coolest stuff. But it's the commercial applications that are really interesting to me. 
Um, so I mentioned agriculture is, is by far the, the, big, the big vertical. Farming, as you know, has become very high tech and often robotic, so cows are all milked robotically, et cetera. But standard crops suffer from a kind of a serious information gap. Let's say, there's a, let's say you've got a wheat crop. Um, so wheat fungus or wheat blight, I guess, is a problem. How do you know if you have wheat blight? Well, the simple answer is you, you, you walk down the road and you sort of check the wheat plants on the left of the road and you check the wheat plants on the right. These farms are like miles. And you basically you do a little spot checking and um, th th you just don't have any data. So instead, they, they, they spray the fungicides according to the calendar. So in June, you spray fungicide on the crop whether it needs it or not. Why do you spray chemicals, expensive chemicals that are bad for the soil and bad for people? It's because you don't know. If you, if, however, if you flew over the crop, farmers are great at, at, at using their eyes to see this. If you flew over the crop, it's like, oh, that right there, that, that dark spot? Now uh, let's walk over to that and let's measure that and that could be a fungal blight. And at that point you decide, and until I see the dark spot, I don't spray. Um, and you know, so like yesterday we had the tomato farmers. The tomato farmers say the big thing for us is when to harvest the tomatoes. There's like a 24 hour window when they're just the right ripeness. And it's very hard to tell because the ripeness is not uniform across the crop. So what we want is we want to fly over and we want you to just sort of take pictures of the whole thing, stitch them together, do a pixel averaging thing and find out in what, the, what, the, uh, what the color and size of the red pixels are. And based on that, on that you know, we'll come up with a uh, measurement of whether it's, whether it's uh, harvest time. And I could go on, but um, so, so farming's a big one, um, and then a lot of conservation. You know, in Berkeley, where I live, they, um, uh, they, they tried to ban the drones, and um, it's Berkeley, they, they, ban, they ban everything. Um, but they, they quickly realized that um, they can't. Um, it's a jurisdictional problem. It turns out that privacy in the United States, privacy is done on a, on a community basis, based on community standards. And at what is your reasonable expectation of privacy in your backyard? I mean, that's to, to be decided on a kind of a year by year, community by community basis. But it's decided on a community basis. Re privacy regs are local regs. Um, the air, however, is federal. Uh, the, it, Berkeley does not control its airspace. No city controls its airspace. So Berkeley can pass all the rules it wants about drones. It's got no jurisdictional power. And the FAA has no authority or reason to get involved in privacy. So you basically have this kind of total disconnect, an impedance mismatch between the local and the global, and between the ground and the air. I'm completely aware that drones have a bad, bad have a stigma, uh, you know, a military association, weapon association, but so did, the inter so did computers once upon a time, and so did the internet, and our job is to sort of demilitarize drones and to sort of flood the market with positive civilian uses. And soon, when you think drone, you're not gonna be thinking predator with Hellfire missiles, you're gonna think, Oh, when I was going up through Napa, there were all those drones over the crops, you know, doing crop surveys. Or out on the bay, it seems like all the windsurfers have their own personal drones. Or, or you know, on that, that last soccer game, kids' soccer game I was at, you know, all the parents had their own drones, you know, following the soccer ball, you know, to get the <laughs> NFL quality. And, and, and then, you know, over time, we will just win, win, win the, 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 the associations. Someday these things will be super cheap and the sky will be dark with them, right? And you know, at that point, <laughs> at that point we can start to worry about, about the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the soft rain of, of, of dying drones, you know, and, and, and how you have to sweep them, you know, for you sweep them along with the, the, the leaves from the trees, you have to sweep the, the smart dust from the sky. And, Anyway, there's science fiction books that'll talk about that, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm.